Hi, this is Chike Coleman of Real Reviews, and welcome to another issue of our show, Real Reviews Cinematic Underground, where I talk to film critic extraordinaire Chuck Koplinski <laughs> about <laughs> films. So today, Chuck, mm. we saw a film called Chronicle. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of those films that got a lot of attention on Facebook yep. and Twitter, and it, it, the trailer was shown a ton of times on television. Uh, what did you think of the film? Well, yeah, they're very smart in how they marketed it. I mean, they knew who their audience was. Uh, they, you know, and I, I'm no marketing expert, but I would imagine when you do it like that, it must be pretty cheap to uh, get your film known on Facebook and Twitter. In, indeed. I mean, especially when they use all the different selling points of the film, basically, in the trailer. I heard they had a neat little promotion in New York City the other day, uh, in which they had three different uh, lightweight type um, glider type things that looked like people and they had them flying around the city to promote the film because in the film the three heroes or the three teenagers do end up getting powers in which they can fly. Uh, yeah, this is just a basic little twist on you know the whole superhero genre. Um, you know, you have teenagers getting superpowers. What are they going to do? Uh, and I you couldn't help but think of Spider-Man throughout this entire thing because you know that is the prototype for this. Uh, I know that it crossed my mind when I saw it. Yeah, and you know the only difference is, or the biggest difference is, is that Peter Parker, of course, comes from a very stable household. Uh, he has his, you know. He, he, I guess stability is the key there as far as his character is concerned. Uh, and of the three people in the movie who get the powers, I believe the character's name is Andrew. Correct. Uh, his home life is anything but stable. Uh, his uh, mother is dying. Uh, they have no insurance, so she's hooked up to an oxygen tank at home, so he has to witness this. Uh, his father is on disability. Uh, uh, from a firefighter, actually. Firefighter. Uh, he's an alcoholic. He beats the kid uh, regularly. Uh, so there, and he's also a target of a bully, bullies at school. So this kid has a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, uh, simmering below the surface. And of course, he uses those powers uh, in a way that are not conducive. I guess would be a nice thing to say. Uh, in the, the, I like this film for a couple of reasons. Um, the interesting thing I thought with that character was they're they're really walking a tightrope there. You never really endorse the things he does but you understand completely why he does it. And I actually found myself quite sympathetic for him throughout the entire film. Mm. That Even was one of the words that crossed my mind as soon as I left the theater, was regardless of how uh, nefarious and evil his acts were, you know, I was sympathetic to him almost the entire time. Up until a point, there, there, there was one scene in the movie where I was like, Nope, all my goodwill for you is basically lost. And it was basically the turning point where he turned evil. Uh, Stephen, uh, played by Michael B. Jordan, mm -hmm. is up there in the sky with Andrew, you know, trying to get him to, you know, calm down because, you know, he's, he's I, angry. Yeah. I, I suppose he suffered another beating at, at the hands of his alcoholic father. Um, and uh, Andrew just wants to be left alone and... Uh, something happens. Uh, something happens. You know, I... I and, and, of course, uh, that basically made it for me difficult to continue to sympathize with because it, what happened was basically a cliché. Ah, basically, no. it was a cliché when you, when you really look at it. I don't know if I'd call it a cliché, but I could forgive him for that because I don't think at that point they still knew what their powers were capable of, what they were capable of. Right. Uh, so I couldn't help but think of it as an accident. A, a tragic accident, to be sure. Right. But I, I you know, but it he wasn't had control as over he, that, though. I don't think he did. You don't think he did? You think it was just an impulse and then... I, I think he was still figuring out, you know, what I am, what I am actually capable of. Okay. Uh, so, I, yeah, I could still, I could still side with him. Um, the other thing I loved about the film were the special effects. The special effects just seemed absolutely seamless. Uh, yeah, practical. Practi yeah, that's the great word. You know, they filmed this, uh, you know, the whole found footage type of uh, right. genre they've called, where it's handheld cameras and things like that. And I think maybe that helped to make the special effects somehow seem more natural. Which, I, I want to say this, it, it led to, you know, some very interesting camera angles because of the way... Uh, Andrew and his friends, in a way, uh, controlled telekinesis 
via the camera. Yes, and you know, they do break the rules at times. I mean, there are times when we're seeing things that there's Cle no way we should be seeing. Clearly, uh, the, uh, yeah, this can't happen. Not, not as egregious as Apollo 8, 18 last year, where they completely jumped the tracks with that concept. But the special effects, again, I can't help but go back to them. When they're flying, uh, especially when they're first discovering their powers of flight. Yeah, you, you believe it. Yeah, yeah, you get the feeling you're just standing there and it's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the most telling moments is when Andrew was learning to fly, he was picking up little tiny pebbles and pieces off of the ground, which would naturally happen if you're using your telekinesis to yeah. lift yourself. Yeah. There, it's natural that something else would be lifted with you. Yeah, very so, smart, very smart film as far as that's concerned. I, I enjoyed it. I, like you, had a great sympathy of the character uh, of Andrew. I had a great sympathy for him. I wanted the father, who was an alcoholic, to be punished in some sort of way throughout the film. I, I, was, uh, I, w I was angry with uh, the way, you know, the father handled the situation of his wife passing and that he uh, eventually blamed Andrew in a non-disclosed location. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't know. I, I felt uh, an immense amount of sympathy. And when he would, you know, lash out at certain people or he used his powers to gain a small amount of popularity, that even as we were watching him gain it, we knew that he wasn't going to be able to handle all the attention yeah. Yeah. that he was getting. Yeah. And we knew that that was just going to force him to crack more. Um, there is one scene in particular involving the party after the talent show. Mm -hmm. uh, we should mention here that uh, at some point in the film, Andrew is uh, asked to enter uh, a talent show by Stephen, one of the other people who has powers, saying that the telekinesis will make him popular. There's a scene at the party where um, Andrew goes upstairs with a, a pink or red-haired woman. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying to figure out, did he puke on himself? Yes, and on her. Okay. Because remember later in the film, he throws up? Right. Right, and I think it has something to do with his powers as well, once they start to perhaps get out of control. Right. Because I'm assuming he... And I, I also felt a little bit of a symbiotic relationship between the three boys mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the construction of how a, a nosebleed would affect their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, we won't go into grave detail about what that all means. That's the point of using the movie. But I, I, I will say that I felt sympathetic for Andrew all the way throughout the film until the final battle. What did you think of the final battle, by the way? Well, I think another thing I wanted to mention was how well they used the location of Seattle. Uh, Seattle is, is the backdrop, and there's an incredible uh, sequence around the Space Needle at the end, uh, showing you just how, how seamless this computer work can be now. Uh, I, I thought it was very well done. Did you find yourself flinching or nervous at all throughout that whole 20 minute sequence? No, uh, because as soon as I saw a certain statue, I kind of had a feeling I knew how it was all going to come to an end. Uh, I was just continually amazed by how well they did the effects with him pushing the cars out of the way, uh, with the glass c uh, cracking around them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, just, I just was continuously very, very astounded with what they could pull off on what I'm sure was a very small budget. And the other thing that I like, since you mentioned the uh, statue, which we won't go into detail about that either, I love the immediate instant replay we got with whatever happened with the statue. Yes, yes, the media uh, is right there. Right there. Uh, as, as in every other situation when something uh, mentally uh, national news might be going on, mm -hmm. um, Overall, I like the film. My whole advice to viewers is this, uh, that you should not uh, buy the film on DVD or Blu-ray, that it is only one of those experiences that you should have in the theater. Yeah, it's a good crowd movie. It's a, it's a crowd movie, and for that reason, you really shouldn't touch it on DVD and Blu-ray because it, it, its value will not hold up. Right, but I'd still, though, I am going to be interested in the DVD uh, just to see if they have some featurettes and how they did everything. So I would, would love an to, audio to commentary about how they came up with the idea in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm correct, the film was written by 
John Landis's son? Yes, Max Landis, I think his name is. Uh, which, um, you know, pedigree aside, you know, that doesn't exactly prove that you're going to be a great screenwriter, but he did a lot with this material. Mm -hmm. A lot that, you know, I wasn't expecting or thinking about. Right, yeah. Um, you saw One for the Money. I did. No. What I was did. your opinion on that uh, film? One for the Money. One for the Money. And do you think people should see it? Uh, no, I don't. It's definitely not worth your money. Um, Catherine Heigl plays a character named Stephanie Plum, who's popular in a series of novels by an author named Janet Ivanovich, I believe her name is. Yes. Uh, she's at loose ends. She's a New Jersey girl. Her car has been repossessed. Uh, she has nowhere to turn. Uh, she has a relative who owns a bail bonds um, outfit store company, whatever you would call it, and she decides she's going to become a bail bondsman uh, or a uh, bounty hunter, go uh, after the people who've skipped out on their bail. Uh, obviously, she's clueless at this. Mm -hmm. uh, she gets some pointers from a veteran bounty hunter, uh, some of the better scenes in the film, uh, and she ends up chasing a police officer who's accused of murder. The police officer also happens to be her ex-high school crush. Uh, so there's that whole interrelation thing. Um, even though it has no direct connection, uh, the shadow of last year's Bounty Hunter with Jennifer Aniston and Gerard Butler just hangs over this film. It really, that's what I, that was my immediate thought. Like, didn't yeah. this happen already last year? Yeah, yeah, it's your immediate thought, and it's definitely not something you want to have connected with your film coming out, you know, you know out of the shoot. Uh, especially uh, because it's Jennifer Aniston. Yeah, I you mean, know. Her acting talents to me are varied. Um, they don't really have a lot of range within them, mm -hmm. but they, they do vary, but it, it's a very small variance. I think it depends on the material with her. I think she can raise her game when, when it's needed, do but I don't think she challenges herself too often. By the way, before we get uh, too deeply into One for the Money, uh, do you think Jennifer Aniston uh, raised her game in Horrible Bosses? No, no, no. But if you look at some of the low-budget things that she's done, uh, she did the Good the, Girl was one example. The Good Girl. Uh, another film I saw the other night on cable, Friends with Money, uh, was another low-budget thing that she had done, uh, in which she was very good. Uh, I, and, and yeah, The Good Girl, I think, was probably the best film she made as far as showing us what she can do. Um, she doesn't really need to do anything. I don't know what she is trying to prove. I mean, she just seems to be going from one comedy to the next, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but, but it gets stale. It gets stale, but I mean, she's cashing her checks. She's still in the limelight. Apparently, she's the sexiest woman who ever lived, according to some magazine. So, uh, was uh, Catherine Heigl just as stale, or is she the new Jennifer Aniston to you? Mm. I think that um, she was the best part of the film. I mean, I... I is that because you like blondes, Chuck? No, I'm not, I'm not partial to blondes, one way or the other. Uh, but she just seemed very innocent in the movie. I've, I completely believed that she was clueless. I completely believed that she had the best of intentions, and I completely believed that she was actually learning things as she went throughout the film. She, she gave us a character in a movie that uh, you know, didn't deserve a character as, as well-rounded as she was. It's a shame because I think there was a good series of films to be made here around this character, but it's not going to happen because you know, this one just out of the shoot is, is just no good. We've right. seen it before. Right. So you think that the actual franchise would have had elasticity had it been both cast better and given a better story? Well, I'm not familiar with the books, but it's my understanding that there are quite a few volumes in this <coughs> series. So I'm assuming that that was their intention, you know, in adapting this, in adapting this book. But, uh, yeah, they just needed, you know, you know there, there's... I think the biggest problem was the direction as far as the tone was concerned. At one minute it's funny, then the next minute it's violent, and the uh, woman, the director, I think her name was Robinson, she's a veteran of Grey's Anatomy. So you can see that Heigl uh -huh. probably picked her, and you just don't know how to take this material at times. Is it supposed to be darkly comic? Uh, is it supposed to be, you know, are we supposed to be scared at the situation she's in? It's kind of all over the map as far as tone is concerned, and that's the thing that really shoots it in the foot in the end. Uh, okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about today is I wanted to see if we could draw a comparison between Chronicle and another uh, older film. Okay. Uh, but the trick here is you cannot use Spider-Man as we already used that euphemism okay. earlier in the program, despite its many thematic relations to okay. Spider-Man. Well, you had mentioned uh, Kick-Ass before the show. Kick-Ass is one of those films to me that 
kind of embodies, you know, what a person struggles with when they realize that they have something extraordinary. And now, in the case of Kick-Ass, uh, the, the heroes don't really have any power. Yeah, there they're, is nothing extraordinary they're not about even, them. They're not even really skilled, but it's just their learning curve, learning how to, you know, be superheroes. Well, not superheroes, but heroes in general. Another interesting curve and parallel you can make is for uh, from my worst movie of last year, Green, The Green Hornet. Mm -hmm. That has some parallels to Chronicle as well because you've got these ordinary people put in an extraordinary situation. Put themselves in an extraordinary situation. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. They, they all kind of place themselves in an extraordinary uh, situation. If in Chronicle... Uh, the characters had not done what they had done in that tiny hole, then odds are that they would not be gaining powers. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I kick ass. It's a, a movie I really hated uh, for a lot of reasons. Ooh, I'm curious as to why. Uh, it was needlessly violent. Uh, of course, it that. was too too violent. I mean, uh, I, I I don't mind violence. But when it's violence for violence's sake, just to say, hey, see what I can do? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just to, uh, there was no purpose to it. I think that was the problem. There was it. only really one place where I was outright offended in, in the film. The rest of it I found to be watchable. And that was when the fight between uh, Hit Girl and uh, the, the mob boss. Right, right. That was where my... My brain said, okay, this is over the line. Well, the thing that, it, and the other problem with the film is that it's uh, two films in one, and one, one of the films is crap. I mean, the story with Hit Girl and her father I thought was fantastic. Of course. The entire film should have been just about hit them. Agreed. And a great Nicolas Cage performance uh, that went unsung, unheralded. I mean, he was channeling uh, Adam West from the old Batman he, series he really was. Uh, as this character, and I thought it was just hilarious and a really interesting choice. Mm -hmm. uh, the other story, though, with our main hero, the main kid who starts this whole thing, I thought was about as interesting as watching paint dry. Yeah. Uh, so that was another big problem with the film, and unfortunately, I know they're going to make another one. Uh, I don't think it'll happen for years, though. I don't no, it's in production. I think it's slated for 2013. Is it really? Yep. I'm not that excited Get ready. about that. Uh, they got to do it before that girl grows up. That is true. They kind of do. Um, I want to talk with you about uh, another film, and, and it's by no means new. But I'm, I'm just so angry about this that I have to. Okay. Star Wars Episode One. Okay, coming out 3D. next Friday. Mm -hmm. I want your opinion. I, well, I, don't, I, I, thought it was, I think it's interesting. Uh, I'm watching the cartoons, and there is... No mention of Jar Jar Binks at all. <laughs> He's not seen in one clip. No one is saying a thing. I am hoping against hope that maybe uh, the way Mr. Lucas likes to go back and tinker with films, maybe he's gone back and digitally erased the entire character. Uh, That's but if our I remember hope, correctly, at least. he's kind of key to the plot of this first one. So he I don't is, think it's which is happen. sad. Uh, you know, this doesn't surprise me. I'm um, actually visibly angry when I think about Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace in 3D. And I'll tell you why. Because when you see that promo poster, the one with, you know, a little... Darth Maul? No, no, not even that one. The other promo poster, the one that they started back with in 2001 before they even thought about oh, 3D. Oh, okay. The right. one with uh, Jake Lloyd, I believe it is. Right. And... Uh, he, he is standing on this desert place. We don't know exactly he's where. He's walking towards us. He's walking towards us with his head down like this, and you see the shadow of Darth Vader. Now, when I saw that, I was like, oh, this is going to be the best thing ever. Oh, my gosh, this is going to be great. And then I saw the film, mm -hmm. and my heart sunk 12 levels. I thought that was one of the great pieces of poster art in the last decade. It really was. Uh, because it really it, was. it captured the whole, I, I, maybe your reaction was the same, but when I saw that poster, I felt it captured the whole tragedy of the tale. You see this young boy with all the possibilities ahead of him of his life, and you know he's doomed. Mm -hmm. And that poster just summed that up, and there was no mention of that at all. And then it's film. like, well, how, how does he get that way? And watching the film, I didn't really feel any sort of 
I felt sad for him that, you know, he was having to be taken away to be trained as a Jedi because I knew right. he cared for his mother. And, but I was, I was like, I don't really see how this is going to lead to him becoming Darth Vader. And I, as I continued to watch the subsequent films, you know, I really, I didn't care. I, by, by episode two, I didn't care. I don't know. What was your reaction? Well, you know, it's, this is the problem with a George Lucas film. He is so enamored with the technology of it that he overloads his films with that technology. Uh, you know, the sets, the spacecraft, the digital stuff. That, you know, character has always been secondary to him. It always has been. Even in the Indiana Jones films. Sure, sure. But, uh, you know, so that's the biggest problem with his movies. You know, it's no secret or it's no real, you know, that... It's no surprise that the best of the Star Wars films is not directed by him. Uh, you know, Empire Strikes Back is directed by a veteran named Irvin Kirshner at that point, and he knew what he was doing as far as getting to the soul of these characters. Yes, Lucas may have written the story, but fortunately Lawrence Kasdan wrote that screenplay, and you had a guy behind the camera who knew what to focus on. Yeah. Uh, there is no focus in these three films. The there first really three isn't. Films, and that's the problem. It's just... All over the map. If you were to make a Star Wars prequel uh, focusing on the evolution of Darth Vader, what would you have done, knowing that you've seen 4, 5, and 6? Well, I think that the story's there. I think that what he does, story-wise, with how the boy becomes Vader isn't necessarily bad. It's just having to sift through all the other stuff to get to it. And by the time you sift through it, as you say, you don't care. I would, I would keep that story. I would just pare it back, though. <laughs> I would just pair it back and just tell a straight story without all these special effect sequences. We don't need the pod race in the first one. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to be a bit more minimal if you want to have an emotional so you impact. So you would have done what I would have done, which is to strip back most of the technology, if not all of it. Right, and then cast a better actor as Anakin. Sorry. I mean, the kid. Oh, has thank been, you. I'm not alone well, here. I, well, no one is. I mean, everyone kind of. Uh, Hayden Christensen, unfortunately, is going to have to have. You know, that'll be the millstone of his career. He has made under other films in which he's been better, but he just wasn't suited to that part. I don't even think it's that he wasn't suited for that part. I think it's the dialogue. Well, it's that again. That we're we're going back to the whole Lucas problem: the yeah. dialogue and the fact that when he directs, he doesn't know how to direct people. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I think... He knows how to direct situations and scenarios. Right. But that's it. He doesn't know how to direct people. He doesn't know how to get the emotional weight of what is on a person's shoulders across on the camera. Yeah, well, I think Harrison Ford, there's the Harrison Ford anecdote. I, th I was during one of the Star Wars films in which he made the comment to Lucas that, well, it might be easy to write, but it sure is hard to say convincingly. Yeah. And there you go. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there have been books written about this. There's a great book put out by the British Film Institute on Star Wars. And the whole concept is, is that they consider Lucas to be a guy who has, is, is straddling the line and that he really is more sympathetic or more interested in the Empire than the Rebels when you see all the toys the Empire has, when you see how cool Darth Vader is, when you see how much time he really spends with the technology, mm -hmm. because the Empire is technology driven, you mm -hmm. see a guy who that's what his sensibility is, when his, what it, you know, whether it's his approach to storytelling or filmmaking. He's a technical guy. The human element, be damned, <laughs> because he doesn't know how to handle it. I agree completely. You know, and they trace that back, it's a great book, because they trace it back to his relationship with his father. Apparently, his oh. relationship with his father was not great, uh, and they, they posit that this might be the thing. But look at all of his films. American Graffiti. The stars of American Graffiti are the cars. Mm -hmm. you know. Agreed. THX 1138. Yeah, There's which, a great chase sequence in that film. Yeah, which I, I have felt like the human element was lost in that film as well. And well, I, that film is about losing your humanity or having it beaten, you know, taken away from you. You're which, a number. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's always been the problem. With, with his films. Um, as far as it coming out on 3D, whatever. Whatever. Uh, I don't know. I believe that that just angers me because it's needless. Well, a lot of the 3D is needless. I mean, it certainly is needless that Disney is doing it as well. Does mm -hmm. that anger you? Um, it depends on, you know, what environments and how they 
capture the people in those situations. No, Usually, but I'm saying I'm saying they're you know they're bringing out Beauty and the Beast. That they're does doing, anger me. I mean, they're doing it as well. Yeah, you know, I mean, it does anger me because I feel like there's nothing you really need to be immersed in when you're doing that to a classic film. Even when you're doing it to a Pixar film, I think that most of the time. It's not needed. Now, Up was one example of, well, thank you. You know, that's why they do it. Yeah, I know. And yet, I will be there for Titanic. You, okay. Now you really have to explain yourself. I don't care if we go over time. You have I to like the film. And I don't think I need to apologize for it. I like the film. I'm I not going to make you apologize for it. I just want to know your rationale. It's a movie that needs to be seen on the big screen. Whether it's in 3D or 2D. I will be there when they release it. It's not a film that works on TV. It's not a work, film that works on DVD. You've got to see it on a big screen. See, now I have to make a joke here. You just want to see Kate Winslet get drawn again, don't you? That's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> That's a plus. But, I mean, as far, I mean, that film was made for spectacle. You have to see it that way. Yeah, I mean, for me, here's the thing about Titanic. The two uh, love interests of Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet are strong. But as soon as that ship hits that iceberg, all my, all my goodwill and love for the film just kind of goes away. It kind of drains from my body. Why? Because now... That's the spectacle we're waiting for. Yeah, but I, I wanted to see humanity. The only people I saw humanity from... When that ship was going down, other than Jack and Rose, was, was that quartet, that, that stupid orchestra quartet that was playing uh, to the last man. They were valuing each other, and they were supporting each other, even though they knew the worst was yet to come. Well, the Kathy Bates character, I think, also uh, in, you know, speaks out of the outrage of all that's going on. Uh, the captain who goes down with the ship does the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy uh, who, um, Vincent Garber, was the actor, yeah. he goes down in his cabin because he knows it was all his fault. You know, the company, I think he represents the company. Um, you know, uh, you, yes, I, I guess you have a point, but then again, I, we go for the spectacle. I, yeah, I and, just want more of that aspect in the film. Well, but and of course Cameron ha has a, been critical been criticized in the same way Lucas has as far as being enamored with the technology more than characters. And I, but I think Do you that think that's true of Avatar, though? I hated Avatar. Oh, with every good. Inch I'm of not my alone being. there. Uh, and I think that's the most egregious example of it. Uh, he uses an excuse of humanity to get that thing going, a tragedy, and I, I think it's just an excuse. I think he was really smart in his career, though, as far as dealing with the human element when you have three movies of yours, or two movies of yours, in which the human element is gone in your main character and it's a robot. I thought, I mm -hmm. think that's a master stroke of his with the Terminator films. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, you, you, get, you, you get what you expect. I mean, you get what you pay for. And with Cameron, I'm not going in to see Lawrence of Arabia. I'm not going in to see Casablanca. I'm going in to be wowed. And if he ends up moving me, well, then that's something nicely unexpected. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's the bonus to the price of admission that you paid. Yeah. I, I think that's what we're really talking about here is director's obsession with technology and losing that whole human element and that character-driven side or that strong story that really moves us to a different place. Yeah. Uh, we found that in things such as the artist, of course, uh, your, your technology was basically stripped from the film, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, the usage of sound. And I believe that when you really go to the human element of that story, it's really about a man losing himself because of all the stature he used to have and then finding himself again. And he loses himself because of new technology. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now that's not to say that a film that has a lot of special effects or is technology heavy cannot also deliver a good story or a moving story. I mean, it, it is possible. It's hard for me to pinpoint the last time that was actually done and well. One movie that I always go back to is Minority Report. Oh, well, yes, yes, that's obviously uh, it. <laughs> well, but it's a movie that's often forgotten. When you mention Sp Spielberg, I bet for mm. most people, ten other films come yeah, to mind. Yeah, Minority Report Minority doesn't even Report. touch their list. Neither does AI, which I also think is a... Incredibly overrated. Uh, yeah. I think Minority Report is the science fiction film that 
is the best of his, it's other than I, I don't like AI or the way it ends. Okay. But Minority Report, you've got an emotional pull, you feel for the guy, he's lost his son, and yet you have all this incredible technological spectacle going on. Right. Uh, I, I, in many ways, I like it best of all of his films. You know, a film that comes to mind to me is that uh, really uses technology well and doesn't really use it um, to enhance characters, rather as a means to an end, but it still works wonderfully for the film, and I hope you've seen this film. Bicentennial Man. Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you apparently do not like it. Um, no, other than the fact that it seems to be a precursor for Glenn Close's look in Albert Nobbs, uh, no, no, I did not like it at all. Okay, again, I don't care if we go over time now. I need you to explain why. <laughs> I, it's a stupid story. Uh, it wasn't well done, and I didn't think Robin Williams was convincing, and I just did. Oh, that's a new one. I've never heard you say that before. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, we all have our likes and our dislikes. So, director's obsession with technology, do you think it's going to ruin cinema or improve it? Well, it's nothing new. Uh, you know, if you go back to Cecil B. DeMille, if you go back to D.W. Griffith, I mean, they certainly had the technology of their time, and at, their, at, at the time they were making films, they were ahead of the curve. Sure. And, they, and their films suffered for it as well. Um, no, it's not going to ruin cinema. It'll ruin certain movies. Uh, but as long as there are smart people making movies and that they remember to take care to uh, focus on character, you know, we'll be okay. You know, you, and, and that's why going to the movies is such a great thing. You have such a wide variety of people who approach the medium in a wide variety of ways. Such as Chronicle. Such as Chronicle, yeah. All right, well... That'll be it for our show today. Until next time, I'm Chike Coleman, and this is Chuck Kaplinski, and we'll see you later.